Hello guys, welcome to this video. Today I will talk about threat synchronization and uh, mutexes and conditional variables. We saw previously that creating threads is very easy and straightforward, but when it comes to adding synchronization and using mutexes, critical sections, things get very complicated quickly. So I'm sorry this video is a little bit longer. I try to explain and go a little bit more deeper in this video. Uh, I don't do that many live coding because I wanted to make the video shorter, but I will add the link to my GitHub so you guys can go and download and work on your own time. I'm very excited to create this video. Let's get started. What do we cover today? First, we will talk about C++ mutexes and how we can use them to create mutual exclusion. Then we will talk about locks on mutexes, different versions of locks. And then finally, we will talk about communication between threads, namely using shared memory or conditional variables. Now, why do we talk about mutex? Why do we need mutex? And the main reason, one of the main reasons that we go after mutex is called race condition. Let's talk about it. So race condition happens when two threads, two or more threads are competing against accessing a shared resource. For example, here, two threads, thread one and thread two, are trying to write inside this shared variable g of x. One of them wants to write value of one, the other wants to write value of two. So we say t1 and t2 are racing to write inside g of x. Once this happens, once these two get executed at the end, we don't really know what would be the value of g of x because of this race condition. Sometimes thread one might win, sometimes thread two. Therefore, this is called undefined behavior. Basically, race condition will result to something that's called undefined behavior because we don't really know what the behavior would be. It might depend on the implementation. Now, don't take my word for this. Let's run this and see what happens. I will put the GitHub link in the description if you guys want to run this yourself. So I'm running this a thousand times and these two threads are racing a thousand times to either write one or two. So you can see most of the times we are able to run value of two. So thread two wins most of the times, but there are some times that also thread one wins. So there are some ones here, there's one here. So that means this is something that is not deterministic. So we don't really know what's happening here. Let me show you another example. So imagine I have a very simple function called incrementer, which is trying to increment one variable starting from zero. And it does the incrementation a uh, hundred times. Now, what would happen if I put this inside a thread a hundred times and then run all these threads together? So we have a counter inside 100 threads. Each thread tries to increment it 100 times. One expectation would be to expect G counter at the end to be 10,000 because 100 multiplied by 100 would be 10,000. Let's execute this really quick and see if this would be the case. So the file that you want to look at is under source main, no lock main, and let's run this. So again, I'm using Bezel to run this. Make sure you enable C++ 17, and then let's run this. So again, I'm running this a thousand times. So for a thousand times, I create these threads, a hundred threads of this incrementer. And I want to know what would happen for each time that these threads are running together. And as you can see, most of the times we get 10,000, but there are a lot of times also that we don't get exactly 10,000. We get 9929, 9808, 9936, and so forth. So this is, this is very undeterministic. Hopefully by now I've been able to convince you that expectation is very different than reality when it comes to multi-threading. And hence, welcome to multi-threading. What does go wrong? Each thread tries to increment G counter while it's running in parallel with others. So first of all, there's a race between the two threads for incrementing. Both of them want to increment G counter, a shared resource at the same time. But it's really worse than this because even incrementation is not an atomic operation. It requires reading 
incrementing and then writing back the result. Now, all of these operations between thread one and thread two, in reality, they might get interleaved in an undeterministic way. What do I mean by this? Let's look at one example of interleaving. So for example, thread one might read value of zero. At the same time, thread two might read and then it also reads zero. Then thread one increments and then writes back the value of one. In the meantime, thread two does the same thing, which is increment and writing the same value one. Although write of thread two happened after write of thread one, because we both they both read at the same time, sort of at the same time, or we should say they both read the same value, the result is not what we expected. We expected one thread to increment and then the other thread to pick this result and then increment. So we should have ended up with a value of two, but in reality, we end up with the value of one. The reality is even worse because even reading or writing variables inside memory is not an atomic action. By that, I mean reading gcounter from memory might get split into two separate operations. So thread one tries to read the first half. Before it has the chance to read the second half, thread two comes in, reads, increments, and writes. And then only after that, does thread one have a chance to read the second half? And you can see this would be a completely junk value because it read the first half from the first value of G counter and then the second half from some modified value by thread two. As if this was not enough, there is still other problems. So you write some code and you think that would be executed, but that is not the case. Your machine tries to fix your code. So Basically, you should always realize or remember that what you write is not what gets executed. What do I mean by this? You write some code, then compiler comes in, tries to optimize your code with different techniques like reordering, loop unrolling, and other techniques. Then CPU takes this result and then does other optimizations, for example, out of order execution, branch prediction, and then there's cache. Cache does prefetch and buffering. Sometimes you write, you think you're writing in the memory, but it's not happening. You actually only write inside the cache. Only after cache, maybe several levels of cache, do you write inside main memory. So you should always remember compiler, CPU, cache, maybe other things, are telling you that you don't know really what you're talking about or what you're writing, or hey, let me fix or improve your code for you. What you're writing is not what you want. Let me fix it for you. Looking more accurately for what happens with cache, one expectation is that if you have multi-threading, if you have multiple threads, they all read and write inside memory. But this is not the case. Each thread may read or write inside cache, and then there's multiple levels of cache, and then only then do they have a chance to write inside memory. So one change from this thread, it thinks it's writing in a memory, might only happen in this cache and then the other thread may not even see it. Let's summarize all the problems that we talked about so far. Race condition creates undefined behavior. And that mostly happens because two or more threads try to access a shared resource like memory. And then they use operations that are not atomic. If increment, read, increment, and write was an atomic action, we didn't have this problem that we just saw. Also, operations get interleaved. We saw that one read operation from one thread got split. And then during that time, during read part one and part two, memory got corrupted. And then lastly, we saw that due to optimizations, the actual executed code might be completely different. Now, this last problem is something that we're not used to it. And that's because in single-threaded programming, for the most part, all of these optimizations from compiler, from CPU, from cache, they're not observable. But when it comes to multi-threading, optimizations become observable. Again, welcome to multi-threading. Remember that the main problem happened because we had shared data. All of these problems, race and not being atomic operations, they all happen because you're trying to access shared data from multiple threads. This is the mother of all evils. 
which causes race conditions and wrong order of operations. I talked about all of these problems to get to the solution. What is the solution? Let's get to it. I can think of multiple solutions and I can group them into several categories. The part that we are focusing today is mutexes and locks. There's also STD atomic in C++, which I would love to talk about in a separate video. The third solution is something that I called abstraction, which are techniques like CSP communicating sequential processes, the actors model, and MapReduce. And I would love to talk about at least CSP and MapReduce in separate videos, hopefully, but today our focus would be on mutex and locks. Mutex and critical sections. Mutex stands for mutual exclusion. Remember the problem that two threads are accessing a shared resource like memory. So the idea with mutex is to protect this shared memory with something that we call critical section. And only one of the threads can enter this section at all time. So either thread one has access to the shared memory and thread two has to wait, or thread two accesses the shared memory and thread one has to wait, but not both. So the increment now would be read, increment, and write. So either thread one can do all of these operations in series without being worried that thread two accesses this memory, or thread two can do this without being worried that thread one accesses this memory. So either thread one accesses followed by thread two accessing or thread two accesses first and then thread one has a chance to do its work, but not at the same time. So the operations on this critical section on this shared memory cannot overlap between thread one and thread two. Remember the problem that one thread was reading G counter in two halves. So when it was done with the first half, thread two would kick in and corrupt the memory. And then once it gets back to read the second half, it would read something invalid. It was not a continuation of the first half. So this problem can be solved with mutex. Now thread one can enter the critical section, perform its first half, have peace of mind that when it comes back and do the, the, the second read, nobody comes and corrupt the memory. Thread two has to wait. Only when thread one is done with the critical section can thread two start and do its job or thread two can start first, only when it's done can thread one start. And again, we have peace of mind that the entire operation can happen atomically without any other thread accessing this part of the memory. What do you need to know about mutex? It implements the either me or you policy or mutual exclusion, makes operations atomic. And then if one thread is in the critical section, the other has to wait. So either thread one waits for thread two or thread two waits for thread one. This blocking feature that one thread has to wait for the other thread is a side effect of mutual exclusion, which we will get back to it later in this lecture. All right, enough the theory, let's do some coding. Step one, Define a shared variable of type std mutex. This creates the mutex and has to be shared among all the threads that are using a critical section. Now, once you have this mutex, you can call lock to start your critical section, which in this case is incrementing, and then call unlock to end the critical section. So the critical section is within lock and unlock. And that's it, that's as simple as creating a shared variable, and then do lock and unlock on it. So again, let's see this in action. The file I'm running now is under source main mutex, and it's called lock unlock main. So we define the mutex as a shared variable, and then there's our counter, also a shared variable, and we used lock and unlock to create the critical section for G counter. Each thread is incrementing 100 times, and then we have a hundred threads later in the main function, we create a hundred threads. So we expect to see 100 multiplied by 100, 10,000 increments. In this experiment, we run all these 100 threads a thousand times, and we measure how many times we got the 10,000, which we expected. So now I run this, and you can see every single time I got 10,000. There's no other result except that we are sure about this using this assert expression. 
All right, congratulations, Mutex works. What do we need to know about SCT Mutex? You need one Mutex per critical section, and you need to define it as a shared variable among all the threads that are using it. What do we need to know about lock and unlock? Lock and unlock should match. For example, here, if I have one lock, I cannot call another lock after this. It has to be one lock followed by unlock, and then again followed by lock if you want to. You cannot have two back-to-back -back unlocks or back-to-back -back locks. There are two minor problems with lock and unlock on a mutex, which is if we forget to unlock, this lock on the mutex will remain and we might get deadlock. The other problem is that if for any reason in this critical section, an exception happens, we will jump outside of this for loop and we never have the chance to unlock. So the mutex again will remain locked forever. And you never want to leave a mutex locked forever because other threads will not have a chance to get into the critical section. So two problems, do not forget to unlock and you need to be aware of exceptions here. In order to simplify this, C++ provides something called lock guard, which is very similar to mutex lock and unlock. So again, you create a mutex as a shared variable and you pass it to this variable's constructor, which is of type lock guard. Now, as soon as this variable gets constructed, automatically the mutex get locked. The critical section happens as soon as this constructor is called. And then you can do whatever you want inside the critical section. And then once this variable is out of scope, basically it's destructed, unlock is called automatically. So this way you don't have to call lock and unlock yourself, it's done automatically. So if you forget to unlock, you're safe. And then if exception happens, again, we jump outside, but outside of this for loop, this guard doesn't have scope, its destructor is called, and then the mutex is not locked anymore. This pattern is called RAII, or resource acquisition is initialization. Basically, as soon as we construct, we get locked on the mutex. So it's preferred to use lock guard instead of directly calling lock and unlock on a mutex. Up next, unique lock. Unique lock is basically lock guard plus an option to lock and unlock. So again, you have a shared mutex. You create a variable now, instead of lock guard, we have unique guard. Again, as soon as this is created in the constructor, the mutex locks automatically. If we jump outside of this for loop in the destructor, the mutex get unlocked automatically. But compared to lock guard, what we had before, you can also optionally do lock and unlock if you want. So this gives you similar functionality plus the RAII of lock guard. Very simple, not that special. Up next, there's shared lock. Basically, shared lock is again a critical section, but you can have multiple readers. What do we mean by that? First, your mutex now has to be of type shared mutex rather than mutex that we saw before. If you're writing into something, you use unique lock, which we just saw, which uses shared mutex now. But if you're just reading the variable and you're not modifying it, you use shared lock. So unique lock for all the writers and shared lock for all the readers. This will still create critical sections for both writers and readers. But what happens is that only a single thread can be in this critical section on their unique lock, but multiple threads, which are only reading now, can be in this critical section. So if there's one thread in this section, nobody else, including all the readers, can be here. So we have only one writer. But if you have multiple readers and there's no writer, one or more threads can read at the same time. Up next, multiple locks. In some applications, you need to lock on multiple mutexes. For example, here in this function, I'm using lock guard, which, which we just saw, to lock on mutex one, and then after that, I lock on mutex two. So I create two lock guard variables. Now this is bad because there might be another thread which does something similar, but in reverse order. So it locks on mutex two first, and then locks on mutex one. This is bad because what if thread one locks on this mutex at the same time, thread two locks on mutex two. So again, we have a race condition. Now thread one is locked on mutex one, waiting for mutex two. Thread two is locked on mutex two, waiting for thread one. This 
is called deadlock because thread one is waiting for thread two, thread two is waiting for thread one. So this is bad, please do not write your code like this. In order to address this, there is something called std lock function, which takes the mutexes that you want to lock on them. And it has this feature called all or nothing. Basically, this function tries to lock both of them, both of the mutexes at the same time, and it gets blocked otherwise. So there would be no case that it locks one mutex, but not the other. It has to lock either both or none of them. So this situation of deadlock that we saw here would not happen. Now, once you do this, your critical section really starts right after this function. Now your two mutexes are locked. After this, we still need to unlock these mutexes. That's why we create these lock guard variables, lock one and lock two, but we give it this parameter, which basically tells the constructor that you don't need to lock the mutexes automatically as you did before. So just create these lock variables without locking them because they're already locked here. Why do we do this? Because at some point we need to unlock these mutexes using the destructor or RAII pattern. Once we come out of this loop, these two mutexes we get unlocked. So this method is better than what we saw before. But if you're scratching your head and thinking this is not a clean syntax, you're not alone. C++ provides a really clean syntax for multiple locks. So forget what I said here. You really want to use something that's called scoped lock. So you create a variable of type scoped lock and you lock the mutexes. So this has the, this is using the RAII pattern inside the constructor. It tries to do this all or nothing lock on the two mutexes. And then once it goes out of scope, it does the unlock on them automatically. So this is the recommended way of creating multiple locks. All right, I introduced a lot of different ways of locking mutexes. Let's compare them together. So the first thing we saw was a direct lock and unlock on std mutex. It was fine, it was simple, but you need to remember to unlock and remember that in case of exception, mutex remains locked. If you address these two problems, you're fine, go ahead and use this. Next, we saw lock guard, which has the locking with RAII. That means you don't need to directly call lock and unlock. As soon as you declare this, you lock, and then when it goes out of scope, you get unlocked. Then we saw unique lock, which was basically lock guard, but you could optionally do lock and unlock following declaration of this variable. So it gets locked as soon as you declare it, but you can still optionally do lock and unlock. After that, we saw shared lock, which is basically unique lock, but you can have multiple readers read at the same time so you don't block them unnecessarily. Finally, we saw scope lock, which was similar to lock guard. It has RAII, and it's used for multiple locks to avoid deadlock. You probably have noticed that all of these are basically the same thing. You always need to create a shared variable of type mutex or a shared mutex, and then lock or unlock to create your critical section. And these are nothing but convenient functions and wrappers around this basic concept. Up next, conditional variables. The main reason that we're going after conditional variables is that one thread wants to send a message to another thread. Let's see an example. For example, you have thread one that produces some data and then thread two wants to consume the result of this data production. So that means naturally thread two should wait for data to become available. So what happens is that at some point, thread one produces data and then it should somehow in a message or notification or somehow tell thread two that data is now ready. At this point, thread two can stop waiting because data is now ready, sample data and consume it the way it wants. So conditional variable is all about sending a message. Now this producer consumer is nothing new. We have seen this pattern in a lot of places. For example, all of you guys, when you use the internet, our laptop or our tablet or our phone sends a request to a server, the server produces data, and then at some point it sends it back to us so that we can consume it. A similar thing happens in pipeline CPUs. One stage uses the data from the previous stage. Same thing in DMA controllers. The same pattern is very common in multi-threading. Often one thread produces some data, one thread 
consumes it and there needs to be some sort of synchronization between them. How do we do this? So one common way, one easy way is to have thread one, the producer, access some shared memory. So it produces data, puts it inside this shared memory, G data. And then there's a flag here that once data is ready, it sets the flag. Thread two, because this is shared memory, can monitor this variable, this flag. When G ready becomes true, it samples data and consumes it and moves on with its life. So basically thread two's job is monitoring this and sampling this. And now you guessed it right, because this is a shared memory, we have to create a cr critical section. So producer and consumer both access this shared memory. There is a race condition and critical section is important. Now, how do we implement this in C++? So this is our producer function. You can see I used a unique clock to create a critical section. Here we produce data and here we set the flag to be true. On the consumer side, again, we create a critical section. We monitor this ready. And then once this ready becomes true, this while loop unblocks and then we can move on with our life and use the data the way we want. But notice that while we are waiting, we have to keep unlock and lock the mutex because what happens if the consumer executes first? It samples the flag, it has to unlock the mutex so that the producer can go ahead if it wants to and produce data. But if the producer is slow, the consumer can lock again and sample data again. And then if it wasn't ready, then unlock and then gives the control back to the producer. So you can see we have this busy waiting lock here going on, which is not efficient. So this is not considered as a good way of programming because it, you keep the CPU busy here and you keep locking and unlocking this mutex. Now, another way is to add some delay here. So put the consumer to sleep for some arbitrary number of milliseconds. This is a little bit better. Probably you burn less CPU cycles, but we still don't know what exactly should be this number. And we are still doing unlock and lock a lot of times unnecessarily. So this is still a bad way of multi-threading programming. In previous model, we had a shared memory, the G data for your data and G ready for a flag that basically indicates if data is ready or not. And then we put it inside a critical section. With conditional variable, we still have these two, but we also add a conditional variable called G underscore CV. So we still have G ready, we still have G data, and we still put everything in a shared memory. And you guessed it right, this has to be inside a critical section. Now, what happens is that thread one produces data, sets this flag to true, but it also sends a notification through this conditional variable. Thread two, rather than monitoring G ready, waits for a notification to arrive on G underscore CV. So it receives a notification. So you can consider conditional variables to be a notification channel between producer and the consumer. It's very similar to the notification system on your mobile phone. You don't keep checking your messages, but whenever a message comes, you receive a notification. That's exactly what a conditional variable does. Now let's see how do we implement this in C++. Let me show you. Step one, you create a mutex, you create std conditional variable, and you still have your G ready and your G data. This is inside shared memory between the two threads, producer and consumer. Now the producer, in order to send a notification, calls a function on this G underscore CV called notify one or notify all. In this case, we just have one thread, so you can just call notify one. On the consumer side, whenever you want to wait on a notification, you just use the same conditional variable and then you wait on it. A wait takes two parameters. One is a lock that we saw before, which is a lock on a mutex. And then the second parameter is a predicate. Basically, you read this as wait until G ready becomes true. So wait until whatever this function is here returns true. Let's look at the complete code for conditional variable. So we have a producer that is in an infinite loop and produces data. It creates a critical section using a unique clock. So it produces data, puts it in the shared memory, and then it sets a flag that the data is true. 
Consumer also is inside a infinite loop and also creates its own critical section and it waits until its notification becomes true. It actually waits on two things to happen. First, this flag to become true, that's what's happening inside this predicate. Secondly, it waits for a notification to arrive from the producer. Once these two happen, it can go ahead and sample data, use it the way it wants to, and then it resets the ready flag for the next time. Now notice that this wait, if it gets blocked, it calls the unlock function on this mutex automatically. That's why we pass ul, this unique lock, to the wait. And if it gets unblocked, it calls the u1 lock automatically. Why does this happen? If it gets blocked, it has to unlock the mutex so that other threads, namely producer, can enter the critical section and produce data if they want to. And if it gets unblocked, it has to lock the mutex automatically so that it can sample data from shared memory without being worried that other threads can corrupt the memory. So again, remember, wait does two things. If it gets blocked, it calls unlock automatically. If it gets unblocked, it calls lock automatically. Once we sample data, we reset this flag, and then we can tell the producer that we did sample data, so you can go ahead and produce your next data. In order for this to happen, producer by itself is now waiting on gready to become false. So now two things should happen for producer to pass this line. gready should become false, and the consumer should send a notification back to the producer. So you can see there's this two-phase handshaking between producer and consumer. One sends a notification to the consumer, and then the other one sends a notification back to the producer. This way, they can lock and send data, and then the, the, the data wouldn't be lost. The consumer uses it, and then once it uses it, it tells the producer to produce the second one. There's some sort of a flow control happening between them using one conditional variable and sending and receiving these notifications. So again, in this diagram, we saw that we use the a conditional variable just to send a notification using this notify1 function, and then we receive the notification using wait. What we saw in the code was the exact translation of this diagram. It's very easy, very straightforward. What do we need to know about conditional variable? So the conditional variable should be shared between the sender and the receiver. You create a shared mutex. On the sender, you lock on that mutex. Typically, it can be done using lock guard or unique lock. Then you modify shared data while the lock is held, and then finally you call notify1 or notify all to notify the receiving threads. For sending notification, namely calling these functions, you don't need to be inside the critical section. So if you remember here, we came out of the critical section and then we called notify1. Same thing in consumer, we called notify1 outside of the critical section. This part doesn't need to be in the critical section. Now on the receiver, you use a unique lock. So you don't use lock guard anymore. You use unique lock because you have to pass it to the wait so that it can do automatic lock and unlock that we just saw if it gets blocked or unblocked. And that's really it. I think at this point, we all know what a conditional variable does, how to create it, how to send notifications, and wait on it. This wouldn't be a complete lecture without a homework assignment. So these are some homework assignments for you guys to have something to think about. Number one, C++ provides notify one and notify all. Please go ahead and check the documentations for these. And then see if you can come up with a method. What if we only want to notify a specific thread? The functions that are provided are only notify one and notify all. How can you just send a notification to a specific thread? Question number two, how to break the infinite loop in producer and consumer? So I put the producer is waiting in this infinite loop. The consumer is also waiting in this infinite loop. What if at some point the producer wants to tell the consumer, I don't have any more data, so please don't wait on it and move on with your life. How can this happen? Now that we know about critical sections, let's go a little bit deeper and have a closer look at them. Remember that lock is what creates the critical section. What you need to know is that lock by itself is an atomic action. So this lock here will not get separated into multiple operations. It will get executed atomically. Lock is a blocking operation. So if some other mutex has locked, this one 
blocks the calling thread. That is important. Now, prior unlock operations on the same mutex synchronize with this lock. That means an unlock on this thread synchronizes with this lock. This has a specific meaning, which we get to it in just a minute. And then there's going to be undefined behavior if the thread that already owns the mutex calls lock again. So for example, here I have G mutex lock. If I call lock again, that is illegal. That will create an undefined behavior. You need to have a lock and then this thread cannot call lock again, it has to call unlock before calling another lock. What do we need to know about unlock? Unlock also is an atomic operation. So this operation here by itself is an atomic operation and it doesn't get interleaved. Unlock synchronizes with the next lock on the same mutex. And again, the behavior is undefined if you call two unlocks sequentially without having a lock in between. Now, another important thing to remember is that we had this race condition and in order to resolve it, we kind of prescribe critical section, mutex and lock. And we use this as a medicine, but just like any other medicine, it comes with side effect, namely deadlock. So deadlock is a very important side effect of mutex that should not be forgotten. Anytime that you write a multi-threading program, you need to analyze your code and make sure it doesn't deadlock. Remember, we had this case that one thread was waiting for another, and then the second thread was waiting for the first one. Now you might have longer cycles, you might have one thread waiting for another, and then this thread for some reason creates an exception and never reply back. These are all very bad situations, and you need to make sure your code can handle it. One last important thing about mutex is that it's a little bit more than creating mutual exclusion. Namely, it also provides something that's called sequential consistency. Sequential consistency is something that's defined by C++ standard, and here we just talk about it briefly. Consider I have two threads. One runs this function, f1, which creates a critical section and adds the global variable g of x by one. The other does the same thing but adds g of x by 2. Because we have critical sections, either f2 runs first, then f1, or f1 runs first, then f2. They don't run together. But now the question is, when f1 runs, who guarantees that the result of this assignment will be visible to f2? When g of x updates, we learned previously that the result goes inside the cache, which may not be visible to F2. The cache on this thread may not be visible to this thread. So how does this work correctly? Fortunately, C++ standard requires that unlock of this critical section synchronizes with lock of this critical section. Remember that there is an implicit unlock in the destructor of this lock guard, and there is an implicit lock inside the constructor of lock guard. Now, this synchronization means something important. It means that the values written by F1 are required to be picked up by F2. That means C++ standard requires the implementation to solve this problem. So the implementation requires to make sure whatever is written here will be accessible to F2. That's why we can use mutex not just for race conditions, but also for sequential consistency and have peace of mind that when one thread writes, as long as it's inside the critical section, the other thread has access to the result. So you don't have to be worried about anything. There's nothing really new to learn while you code, but Remember that if you want some memory location to be picked up by the other, you need to put it inside mutex. And then you're protected against these cases that one writes in the cache and then the other one does not see the result from the cache of the first thread. Now let's look at conditional variables more closely and go a little bit deeper. One question for conditional variables is that can wait wake up spuriously? Spuriously means when I'm waiting inside a thread, can I wake up without anyone actually sending us a notification? And weirdly, the answer is yes, and it has something to do with OS implementation. Don't ask me why, there is the reason for this is outside of the scope of this video, but just be aware that wait, this wait 
can be called and passed for no apparent reason. And that's exactly why we use the predicate. This predicate protects us against spurious wake-ups. So if we wake up for no reason, we check this predicate. If it's not true, then we go back to sleep. So it's important to always include this predicate. As long as you have it, you're protected against this spurious wake-ups. Now, question number two is that can the notifications get lost? Basically, can the producer send a notification to the consumer and somehow this notification would not be observed by the consumer? Suppose we were not careful and we didn't have this critical section. So if I remove this log and I also remove this predicate, now you can observe that we have a race. The producer tries to send a notification. The consumer waits on the conditional variable. Now, if because of the spurious wait, it passes this line, then the producer go ahead and send a notification. This notification will be lost. So if the consumer runs first, passes this line because of spurious wake-ups, then the producer runs next and tries to send a notification. The notification gets lost. That's exactly why we added this critical section. So the answer to this question is no, because we have mutex, which provides sequential consistency, and we also have predicate. Remember that we put all of these variables inside the critical section. This is important to put not only data and red, but also the conditional variable. Now, if thread one runs first and tries to send a notification, because of sequential consistency, Thread 2 that runs next will observe the notification. This is guaranteed by the sequential consistency. Now, if thread 2 runs first and waits, because we have the predicate, if this wait wakes up spuriously, because we have the predicate, it puts the thread 2 back into sleep until eventually this notification arrives and we receive it and then thread 2 can sample data. So in short, Always protect conditional variables using a mutex and lock and always use a predicate. As long as you do this, you're fine. You don't need to be worried about the details. Let's summarize what we learned today. If you have shared variables, you need to check for race conditions. And in order to solve race conditions, you use critical sections using mutex to create mutual exclusion and also create sequential consistency. You use conditional variables for thread communication and also message passing. Namely, you use conditional variables to send notifications. Lock and wait are blocking actions, so you need to be aware of deadlock. We did not talk a lot about deadlock, but it's a big problem that you need to be aware of. I hate to say this, when it comes to multi-threading, sharing is not caring. So you need to avoid and minimize shared variables as much as you can. This shared variable is the mother of all the problems. What's next? I still want to continue creating a few more videos on multi-threading. There are some topics that I would like to talk about. One of them is lock-free programming using STD Atomic. This is rather confusing and although Critical sections and mutexes can solve a lot of problems. This is another method, another tool that we have. The other topic that I would love to talk is about threat safety and STL in particular, and if and how STL containers are threat safe. Up next, I would love to talk about efficient multi-threading, and in particular, I would love to talk about thread pools and how they are managed and created. And lastly, this one is my favorite, I would love to talk about abstract multi-threading. In abstract multi-threading, you can say, hey, I'm kind of sick of dealing with mutexes and logs and all these things. Why not abstract them out and create a method that I can just write my thread in parallel with other threads and not be worried about these low-level constructs. So there are various methods here, for example, communicating sequential processes, which I really like, CSP for short. I would love to create a video on this. There's also actor model. This is another alternative to CSP. And finally, MapReduce, which is vastly used by Google. And I would love to talk about this, how we can use it if we can create our own MapReduce library ourselves. Let me know which one you like more and let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Thank you very much for watching this video. I wish you best and hopefully I can see you in the next ones. Make sure to subscribe and like this video and hopefully I see you in the next ones.